on today. And I see that Kim, you're on. Fantastic. Lots of folks, Bruce and Donna. Great. And Amy, gotta remember Amy. Amy's on. Yeah. And Catherine. And Helen. Great. Lots of folks coming on. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, happy officially spring. We've been saying spring for a while, but we are official spring now. Yeah, prove it here. Oh, great, great. Jeff, great to see you got on. Fantastic. Okay, we are going to talk about traveling today. So let's get started. Welcome everyone, I'm Mary Rebar. I'm the Willamette Valley Care Services Coordinator. And today we'll be, be joining together for our monthly educational topic call. And we will host a presentation on the topic related to living with ALS and PLS and traveling. But first we have housekeeping. A few logistics before we get started. Um, we will be recording this session, so if you prefer to have your camera off, feel free to do that. Um, we do that so we can have this information available in the future, okay? It will be placed on our YouTube channel on our website. Please keep yourself muted through the presentation unless we're asking for questions, and then uh, we want to lessen the background noise if we can. We do encourage you to ask questions. You can place them in the chat box. If you look at the bottom bar on your screen, there's a little bubble that says chat. You can click on that and place those questions in the chat box, or uh, you can raise your hand, um, which is also on the bottom of the screen under reactions. You can raise your hand and we can call on you that way also. And if you are uh, having difficulty hearing, please feel free to turn on your closed caption, which is available on Zoom also, okay? So without further ado, I would like to do some introductions. I'd like to introduce you to Nancy Rasmussen, a person living with PLS on the beautiful Oregon coast and her husband, Steve, they are travelers, officiados. I mean, they go everywhere. I am always amazed and joyful to hear where they have traveled throughout the United States and all over this continent. So I'm gonna turn it over to Steve and Nancy. Thank you for being here today and take it away. Okay, well, as Mary said, I have PLS. Um, after 18 years of doctors and symptoms, I finally got to a neurologist who was smart. She watched me for two years before getting a diagnosis in January, 2012. Noticed the first symptom, I couldn't hold a clutch on the car. The leg was too weak. And a few years later, I couldn't keep up with the lawnmower because it was faster than I was. And when I finally stopped working off my diagnosis, my three-year-old post-op patients walked faster than I did because I was dragging my left leg. That's about it. That's about it. And like she said, I'm her husband, Steve. Uh, it's, it's been a road that we've traveled for the last 10 years, so that's uh, answers the trooper or else it wouldn't be able to happen. I'm gonna start off with one of my favorite quotes. And that is, a fool learns from his mistakes, and a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. And that's what we're going to do today. You guys are going to hear about, not specifics, but mistakes we've made along the way that helped us learn what we know now. Uh, we are not experts. We're, we're pretty good at making mistakes. So that's kind of where we're going with that. In May of 2011, we attended a funeral of a very good friend of ours. Uh, she had cancer. She had it throughout her body. She wasn't 60 years old, but her dream vacation was an Alaska cruise. And she always said, I'm going to do it next year. I'm going to do it next year. Never got there. Never happened. 
We put it off too long. Seven months later, eight months later, Nancy was diagnosed. And if we did decide when at Minna's funeral, we decided then, no bucket list, we are going to go. But the day will come sometime when Nancy won't have the energy to do it. And so we have traveled a lot in the last three years. And this led to some very, very good times, some very, very challenging times, some very, very frustrating times, but mostly good times. What we're going to talk about is a couple of different aspects of traveling. The first one is one that is kind of universal, even if you're just going to visit your family. And that is hotels. We suggest that you look directly with the property. Do not go through Expedia. Do not go through 1 800 Best Western Hotels. Those people rarely know what the property itself looks like or the facility. Uh, You'll see things on the website saying ADA or accessible, but it might not really meet your needs. So you call the property, you can nail them down to exactly what they mean by an ADA room. We had an ADA room once, and one guy from the front desk said, that's not an ADA room. He said, of course it is. It has grab bars around the toilet. That's all it has. There's actually a blogger who is that John guy. Is he a paraplegic? No, so John, he's a problem. triple amputee. Triple, triple amputee. amputee. At one hotel, he was assigned four different ADA rooms, and not one of them was accurate. Was correct. So anyway, whenever possible, talk to the people. If the person at the desk doesn't really know what the room looks like, ask them to take their phone down there and take pictures. Especially the bathroom. The bathroom seems to be really big. One of the issues we've run into many times in rolling showers. Is it has a bench on one side and the controls are clear across the other side. You could reach them. If you can't walk over there, you can't reach them. And of course, the shower head itself is in a high position. We were in a hotel in January and I said, we need a shower bench. If you really need either the bench or the controls to be halfway in the shower, not on the far end. And they sent a guy over who showed us how to fold the, the bench out of the wall. I said, okay, you sit on that bench and turn on those controls. He goes, no problem. He stood up and started walking. I said, no, 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 no walking. He goes, well, I can't reach that from here. I said, we need a shower bench or a shower chair. And anyway, they ended up sending their manager to the store who bought one. I said, save it. We're back in September. We had two do that. Yeah, we got and a, bought a bench. Once you make the reservations and you're assured that you, they know what they're talking about and they got the room, we recommend five to seven days before you go call and make sure make sure when they make the reservations they notate on there not to be moved from this room. We've been moved, we've been had our room given away. Make sure you call and verify that you still have the correct accommodations that you're leaving. Uh, when you check in, inspect the room. We were at one hotel recently. The bed, and it's an accessible ADA room, the bathroom was fine. End of the bed was so close to the dresser, I had a hard time walking through it. The controls for the air conditioning and heater were mounted high on the wall behind the desk beyond the bed. If you're in a wheelchair, there's no way on earth you can get there. No way at all on earth is that an ADA accessible room. We've had furniture that was blocking sliding doors, furniture blocking entrance into pretty much everything. So take a look at the room. If it's not right, go back to the desk. Uh, one thing that hotels hate talking about, unless you're really on top of it, is ADA laws and applies to what products and services they have to provide. I've had, oh, I can tell you a thousand different stories. If, in, in a nutshell, if a hotel offers a service to an able bodied person, they have to offer that same service. To, yeah, am I the, still here? The screen is my screen is went black. They have to offer that same product or service to disabled people at the same price, the same schedule, the same terms. The big one, of course, is the free shuttle to the airport. Hotel shuttles to the airport. Most of the hotels don't have lifts or don't have ramps. And so in that situation, they are required to arrange and provide say a wheelchair cab that you can roll into and just suit your needs. 
I've had um, refuse. We've had them say, won't they have? Uh, some, some realize that is their responsibility. And they'll call the cab and they'll have it prearranged and everything like that. In New Orleans, they sent us information to access the accessible public transit system. That's not providing the same service as I see the schedule. So that is one of our big money moves. Uh, now, for those of you who might be flying out of Portland, Oregon, right now it's broken, but Hampton Inn at the Portland Airport has a wheelchair lift. And you can book it. You tell them when you book it that you're going to need it. You tell them when you check in. They share it with? They share it with the Sheridan. With the Sheridan oh, and... Sorry. Locked. Right now it's broken and we're going to be up there in five weeks, so hopefully it's fixed. But they already know we have to pay for a cab if our equipment isn't working. I would say don't let them off the hook because we were at one hotel, we were in the lobby eating, and the clerk told the caller, Well, we don't have uh, we don't have wheelchair, so you can't stay here. We don't have a wheelchair uh, transportation, so you can't stay here. And so after we finished breakfast, I went and talked to this nice young kid. I said, you know, you're in violation of ADA law by saying that. Said, I don't know. Nobody ever told me. So I said, have your manager call me. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, I'd say hold your feet to the fire. Uh, some of them know, some of them don't know. At the end of this presentation, we're going to send Mary our notes. And we're also going to send a little instructional thing that actually quotes chapter and verse of the ABA law that says they have to do it. And uh, you might not like it because it costs some money, but we would much rather not need it. That would be our preference, not to have somebody pay for it. But that, that not being a choice. So does anybody else have any tips about hotels? Things that you have found that work and help in your stays in hotels along the way? Using a wheelchair. I'm going to jump in real quick and just point out ADA is Americans with Disability Act. That law is more than 25 years old now. And everybody in the United States who offers some form of um, public service, such as hotels, restaurants, tours, things like that, all have to comply. Okay. But they don't. Well, and that's where you let us know, okay? The, in the Willamette Valley, we just had uh, at our uh, Eugene and Salem support groups, we talked about how do you first politely let them know they're in violation, like Steve was saying, and then what's your next step? And if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll get you to the ADA Center here in Oregon. And of course, there's an ADA Center in Washington I can get you to also. But the it's what I call a polite law. First, you have to point it out. You need to record the date and time and who you talk to. The next step then is to contact our advocacy center spirit for Americans with Disability Act. A uh, question came up in the chat. Does the association keep a list of some hotels that are ADA accessible? I keep a few from my region um, because people will call and say, hey, where can you go? I only put them on the list if people living with ALS say they've stayed there and they had good service, okay? So it's not me saying this is good service. This is someone with ALS saying they got great service here. So we do have a few of those listed. Do I know if they have multiple beds in the room? Those are gonna be phone calls you would have to make to the hotel itself because gosh, you know, I may have gotten the recommendation six months ago and now we've had the pandemic, so I don't know what things look like. But, I have yes. to tell you, my biggest frustration is that I'm disabled. My mother is my caregiver. And almost every single hotel room that's quote unquote ADA accessible has one bed in it. Or it has a bed and a pullout couch. So I'm not going to ask my 72-year-old mo mother to sleep in a pullout couch. And I can't sleep in a pullout couch. And one of the things that we end up doing when we travel, I mean, I can't travel on an airplane anymore. It's, I have PLS, I've had it for 14 years. I, I can barely travel a few hours in a car and that requires stopping, you know. I, 
we try to go to the hotel and check it out beforehand. And we've definitely gone to places that said, oh, we have an ADA room. And we've gone with me in my wheelchair and looked at it and been like, nope. Um, and, you know, it, or it, we've looked at it and we thought that it would work. But when we actually stayed there, like I couldn't get on the bed or it just mm -hmm. physically was too difficult, like the furniture that they had in it. Um, and, you know, it's really, really hard to find an, a truly ADA accessible room. And if I were, what I don't understand is none of these rooms, if I were to be alone, I would never be able to navigate them. First of all, the door to get into a hotel room is typically extremely heavy, even in the handicap accessible room. So, you know, I spend a lot of time looking for an ADA room, a room that has two beds, a room that's truly ADA accessible. And we've had some really bad experiences where we were told that rooms were ADA accessible in you know, towns far away from where we live or before I moved to Oregon in other states and you show up and you're stuck in this room and they can't give you another room. And you're just like trapped in this tiny inaccessible room. I mean, we had one room in Connecticut that my walker, I was still using a walker then, couldn't even fit into the bathroom. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Right? I mean, so, yeah. you know, I don't know if the ALS Association would ever consider compiling a, a list for each state or, you know, nationally, but it would be very helpful to have that sort of database because it takes so much time and energy you know, right. an extra trip, right. go and look at the hotel right. and then, you know, right. and then book it. And it, yeah. it's just exhausting. I find the whole thing very exhausting. Well, but I'm going to definitely make that note, Christina, and um, I will definitely connect with you with the, with the rooms that I have received from pals that say are good rooms. Um, and we'll make sure that we're communicating with each other. Okay. okay. When we talk to a hotel, we don't ask for an ADA room. We ask specifically for a room with the roll-in shower. And if they said, well, it's got a tub, it's like, nope, it's got to have the roll-in shower. And if they don't have one, who else in your area does? Because then they have to be big enough. And even the roll-in showers will have sometimes an, a two-inch little lip on them. But it's big enough to bump over. Christina, we share your frustration. We have dealt with that. We're a little bit more uh, able to handle some of that grief. But I got a big mouth and I don't shut up till I get one. Yet. Uh, but we've had, we've been in some rooms that had two beds in the proper bathroom. It was so tight around the beds, you kind of had to park the wheelchair at the foot of the bed and crawl to the pillow. I mean, really, it was too tight. You couldn't get alongside the bed. And if they give your room away when it's been a guaranteed ADA rolling shower, they got to find you another hotel with a rolling shower. That happened to once, once to us in Grand Forks, Montana. Yeah. Great Falls. Great Falls, Montana at midnight. We're driving all day going to Nancy's father's funeral. And they said, oh, we gave it away. We got another one. It's got a ton. You'll be fine. They had to find us a room. And Matt, Take care of the difference in the price. And we've had we've had that happen. In that case, we went to another hotel and they said, how much were they charging you? And I told them our rate's a lot higher, but we'll just we'll just match that rate. Because you've gone through enough today. So I know what I'm saying if I ever go to Rachel Hall's Montana. Yeah, the the chat box also is, yeah, a lot of places going to pedestal beds and you can't put a Hoyer lift under them. I mean, yeah. uh, we don't travel with a Hoyer lift, but, you know, I, I haven't even gotten that far to think about that. I did have one more question, but I forgot what it was. So when I remember, I'll ask you. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to that. Anything else on, uh, not necessarily questions, but experiences or tips, especially tips? Because we stay in a lot of hotels, but we haven't experienced everything you need. Well, I mean, bottom line, tell the person on the phone, take your pic phone, take a picture, Email it to me and let me know what that room looks like, whether it works or not. And I remember most... my question. Um, Mary, do you know if, uh, you know, while Trump was president, 
they changed the process about filing an ADA complaint. So it used to be that the disabled person filed the complaint with the government. Now, then Trump changed it where you had to file it with the business. They had six months to reply and fix the problem. And then if only they didn't reply and didn't fix it within six months, you had to go back and complain to them again. And if nothing was done, then you could go to the um, federal government. So you're, you do have to put the, excuse me, you have to politely tell the business the first time, date, time, who you talk to, all that. Yes, you do have to do that. But then I would take it to one of our ADA advocacy centers because they're going to be able to move quicker and faster than if it's a complaint person to person, right? So if you're one person, a person with a disability complaining to a business, it's you're gonna get a different reaction unless you then an ADA center who can say, listen, here's your, you're out of compliance. Um, this is what needs to happen and it can move quicker. So remember you have compliance within the government and compliance within businesses. And so um, the ADA center can help and not make it a headache for you where you feel like you're taking on the business. You can help get that advocacy center working for you and with you. So yeah, definitely highly believe in the what We have one in Eugene, Oregon. Um, and then we have one of course in Portland and then the Northwest one is based out of the U of Dub Law School. So definitely reach out if you have concerns. And we're gonna move on now to flying. Not really everybody's cup of tea at this point in, uh, with these conditions. I'm gonna let Nancy Carey uh, talk about the flying part because she is firsthand experiencing what it's like to be a person uh, in a wheelchair and flying a commercial mode. Well, actually, the Vancouver, BC airport has a either five or seven part video series of flying with the eye. Uh, we use it in aisle chair. And that'll be in the notes. If, uh, Mary can send out the notes or you the link to it. The link to it. Uh, it's very well done. It's very professionally uh, made video, of step by step by step. But I'm going to let her go through. Oh, I know. I. I follow, follow a guy who's a triple amputee so, and someone was asking, you know, I got to the airport and I'm ready to load my son on the plane who's in the wheelchair and nobody would help me. I says, well, did you put it on his, when you buy the ticket, do you tell the airlines you need assistance? When you drop off your luggage, do you tell them you need assistance? When you get to the gate before they're loading, do you tell them you need assistance? And I've never had an issue of it. They got it in the computer and it's gone smoothly down the ramp to an aisle chair, which is about, <laughs> about that wide. You can either take yourself to the chair or they'll pick, lift you to put you on the chair down the teeny little aisle and you either transfer yourself or they will lift you to transfer you. We are researching going to Australia and uh, Qantas, actually has, sounds like a higher lift that goes down the airplane. Yeah, because there's a lot of paperwork to fill out when you book a Qantas flight. And they said, do you need this machine? And I researched the machine and it's basically a very skinny higher lift to get you into your seat on Qantas. That's the first I've heard of it. Yeah, I don't need it, so I hate it. Yeah. So you want to run through the, what? the points? What? Oh, um, oh yeah. Um, there are two or three different aisles, seats on the planes that are considered ADA seats where the arm of the seat will lift back so you can slide over that going over the top of it. Do not let them put you in the first row behind first class because there are those arms don't move at all. You have to go all the way up and over them. Uh, you start with TSA. Oh, TSA. Yeah. He talks, I don't. 
Um, if you if you plan this line, definitely get TSA pre check because if you don't have pre check, it's a full body pat down and explosives checks and a full pat down on your wheelchair. With TSA pre check, they do an explosive check, pat down the wheelchair, and I'm done. It's a lot easier getting through that way. Um, if they have a power chair, definitely talk to Mary about a loaner and don't take your power chair on the airplane in case there's damage to it. My manual chair had over $2,000 worth of damage done to it by Air Canada. The best we can figure out is they put it by the door and slammed the door and pinched it, pinched it, bent the axle, the camper bar, and the wheels. So we ended up in Eastern Canada with a wheelchair that was barely functional. Yeah, the, the wheel wobbled the whole time we were gone. But Air Canada paid for all the repairs on it. And their company that does the repairs, that does all their paperwork, oh, yeah, another one, no big deal. We know all about Air Canada. They do a lot of it. You're lucky that they fixed it. Uh, there was a woman recently, her $35,000 wheelchair was uh, broken by the airline. I believe it was United Airlines and they wouldn't replace it. And because it was not replaced and it was very specific for her, um, she ended up dying because the she had to use a manual wheelchair, which she can't couldn't use, got some sort of infection and i mean you need to be really careful because they really do not care about um you know the equipment and canada is a lot different than america you know i mean i had a walker broken by an airline i was given a loaner and i was on on vacation for two and a half weeks and they were supposed to replace it in that two and a half weeks and they never did so i had to go home with the loaner because I couldn't use my, you know, the broken one. And I got, they sent me the replacement like months later, which is really not helpful. <laughs> and um, they didn't repair the chair until after we got home because we were on a cruise on the east side of Canada. Yeah. But they did pay for all of it. Not an issue. It just, you took time to get the parts and stuff in. I'm um, glad they fixed it for you. You want me to take over? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you've heard about down chairs. Uh, you, when, I don't know, you, if you've flown, you know this. If you're a wheelchair user, you will board the plane first. And you also get off last. So when you book connecting flights, do not have tight flights. You figure it's going to be a half hour, at least longer, to get off the plane before you can head to that other gate. So you have a, a hour or hour and 15 minute connection i pick a different flight yeah they want you at the gate more than a half hour before the flight takes off or boarding time so that they can board you first also if you're traveling with more than one wheelchair they will take wheelchairs as cargo so you have the one you're in and you're taking another one for whatever reason they'll check that through as they would luggage, and there's no charge for additional uh, wheelchairs or medical equipment. That is gratis. They, they don't charge you for that. Oh, yeah, and wheelchair parts, seat paps, anything like that is not counted against you as a carry-on. We've never even had an airline try to charge us extra for... Nancy has a, uh, a detachable motor for her manual chair. They do get a little worked up about the battery sometimes. It's a lithium battery, but it goes in the cabin with us. And we try to explain that it's not going in the cargo hold, it's going to cause a problem. Uh, one thing that isn't publicized, a little bit off uh, the same topic. At the Eugene and Portland airports, you can park in short term parking for the same price as the economy parking. You know, at Portland Airport, you park in economy parking, you take their shuttle in, up to the front door, you can park in the very first accessible spot if it's available in short-term parking. When you leave, you take your parking ticket. This is more overnight than just the hour. A parking ticket, 
your placard, and the person who is actually holding the placard has to be in their ID, and you go to the cashier on the way out. So instead of paying in Portland, I think it's $28 a day, you'll pay $12. And that is what the rate is out at long term parking or economy parking. It's not publicized, but that is how they do it. I, I don't know if they have to or they just do. And for what it's worth, every seventh night in Portland Airport is free, but that's for everybody. So don't pay at the kiosk and then hope to get your money back. You pay when you're checking, when you're when you're leaving with a cashier. And I can save you a little bit of money. Uh, for those of you who are parking your car in an accessible spot that you're going to need your placard, DMV will issue you a travel placard that's good for 30 days. It's no charge. Uh, you leave one in your car at the airport and take the other one with you for cabs or friends' cars or whatever. And that can, that can help out quite a bit. And like Nessie said, uh, when you get, if you ask for these uh, notes, watch that video from uh, Vancouver Airport. It's actually really, really good. It's like a five or six video series. It is short. It's, it's well done. So anybody else have any tips that could help other people with their airline travel? Okay, now we're going to move on to my favorite, one of my three favorite subjects to talk about in the whole wide world. Your hat. Anybody recognize that symbol? <laughs> uh, we have been blessed to be able to go on several cruises, uh, mass market cruises, not not small ones, not river cruises. River cruises are very very tough on drill cancer. They have big step ups. They don't have very many except for groups. Uh, if you decide to go on a cruise, one thing I'll tell you right now, if they do not have an accessible room available, don't book a regular room. Your wheelchair will not even fit through the door, let alone with the bathroom not be set up right. You won't even get in the door. You really need to pick a different cruise or a different date. Another thing is a lot of cruises have a lot of ports where the ship doesn't dock. If it docks, it works out pretty good. They have a long ramp and their employees will back you down the ramp. Sometimes there's a problem with that because they don't listen to how to do it, but they have people. So in the cases where they're tendered, what it's called when they park in the bay and then they, they use a smaller boat. You cannot take a, a complex power chair on that boat. They will not help you get on the boat. You have to have family help you get on if you have like a folding wheelchair. Uh, it is grueling. It is not easy. I would say pick a, a, a sailing and your your cruise uh, provider can say which ones are which. They used to have them on their website. Now they don't say whether it's not. Either, either you're going to have to try to get on that little shuttle boat and, and you can't stay in the chair. You have to transfer to one of their seats inside the shuttle boat. It's kind of a lifeboat shuttle boat thing. Uh, Either pick one that doesn't have a lot of dock or a lot of tender ports, or just decide in advance that on that day you're going to stay on the ship and enjoy it while everybody else gets off. You have to have the run of the ship because a lot of people just bail out and uh, you try to just lay, lay in the sun if you choose to because it'll be the ship will be deserted except for those yeah you know, few people that. Uh, Cruise lines, cruise ships, even the big mega ship now have very, very few accessible accommodations. A little bit more now on some of these bigger ones, but some of them only have a few. Now, when we cruise, we choose to have a balcony. Some of them only have four. Six. Six? Six on our favorite ship. Our favorite ship is only six, and there's only a couple of junior suites in the next step up. Both early. Those. Those cruises become available a year and a half, sometimes two years in advance. If you know you want to go to Alaska in June next year, watch for it. Work with the travel agent if you want to. We can choose not to, but if you want to, book early so you can still get the, the accommodations are going to be fine. I'll tell you now. There's plenty of room. The bathrooms are monstrous. The people on board could not be more helpful. Once you get on board, they are just They've been over backwards to help people anyway. Wheelchair users, you're like all stars. They really make sure you're taken care of. 
and it's really good. One issue though, a lot of the cruise lines now have gone to refundable and non-refundable rates. So you have to book early to get the get the accessible cab that you want. But if you go to change it, you're either going to pay a penalty or forfeit your deposit. So it's kind of a catch-22. If you you have to book early to get the room, but then if your plans change, it's going to cost you money. We've played it. We've had to pay a couple change fees, but that was our own doing because we paid so bad. Um, if you're using a CPAP, MyPAP, anything like that, when you make your reservations, tell them. Tell them in advance. I bring in a, a CPAP. They will have. If it's not waiting for you when you get there, a station cord because there's very few electronic electrical outlets and distilled water. There's no charge. If they don't have them, your cabinet attendant will go get them. Never had an issue with that. Tell them you're bringing a wheelchair. They're going to want to know whether it's manual or power. Uh, and then they all, all the cruise lines have accessible accessibility department. Uh, get that number when you book. And call them about 30 days before and say, we're a party of four, we're on this sailing, on this date, on this ship. And they will make sure that you get assigned to a dining room table for dinner that is easily accessible by wheelchair. I can tell you more stories about times that didn't really work out for us, where we were passing through rows of tables where people had to either stand up or pull their chairs in just for us to get by. It was embarrassing, frustrating. And we were interrupting other people that and we tried to get a better location and uh, they weren't really cooperative. So find the accessibility department and let them know that that's what you're going to be doing. Uh, okay, cruise lines make a lot of money renting wheelchairs. Sometimes a manual wheelchair, like an Invacare. Buy at Walmart for 80 bucks, it's 200 bucks a week. You'd be far better off going to Walmart, buying one, checking in his luggage for free, and just leave it on the ship. And walk away because it's, it's no better wheelchair. And they have scooters that they want to. That's another thing. When you have a scooter, that's another reason you have to book accessible. You cannot leave it in the hallway. You have to bring it inside the room. And if you have a regular standard room, they won't fit through the door. We watched the guy once zigzag for I don't know how long. And he got it in, banging the walls all the way. And I don't even know where he parked it because the room wasn't that big. And we've seen him in the hallway blocking the blocking the path. It's a fire danger, and they'll, they'll tell you to move it. So back on the original note, only book accessible rooms. Or you pick a different tree. Also, uh, some of the non-US ports that a cruise ship will, will visit, not very wheelchair friendly. You gotta remember there's no ADA law in Jamaica. Uh, the roads are chewed up, there's no ramps, there's just steps to places. So be very cognizant of the fact that if you're getting off ship in some foreign countries, it might not be pretty. Uh, we've had a mixed bag. A place where we've stayed. In 2013, we were booked to do a Mediterranean cruise, which included two days in Rome. Well, if the shuttle, if the tour bus even had a wheelchair lift, Nancy couldn't get off. We were there for two days and she'd have to sit on the bus to look out the window because the cobblestone streets would heat up her wheelchair anyway. And she can't climb the stairs to look in the Coliseum or some of the, the build, oldest buildings. It would have been a waste of time. So we haven't gone to Europe. So no, we're we're never going to Europe. It's interesting because we we're going to go to Italy and Greece and Spain. It all sounded real good, but not accessible. Not something you can get done. So that is uh, our little part about cruising. Did you have something? Yeah. Anybody have else been on cruises or have some tips on how? Cruising can be made a little bit easier for those using a wheelchair. Steve and Nancy, could you address uh, insurance on a cruise ship? Health insurance. Oh, yeah. yeah. We learned hard yeah. on that one. You have to have travel insurance. And Mary knows exactly what I'm going to talk about now. We were in Bar Harbor, Maine, part of the United States, 
Nancy wasn't feeling well. She's on Medicare, and she went to the doctor on board. It's a tender report. We didn't want to mess with any on the little boat and trying to find an urgent care. Put the claim through to Medicare, they denied it. To Medicare, cruise ships are all foreign countries. I tried to argue we were in Bar Harbor, Maine, and if we would have got her off the ship on the shuttle on the tanker boat and found a clinic, they'd have paid it. They said, yes, we would have. I said, we're in Bar Harbor, Maine, part of the United States. They said, no, if you're on a cruise ship, we consider that a foreign country, but we don't pay a penny. Now, if she has a plan F, part F, whatever that is, they would have paid. We didn't see it was committed to them, but it was a big deductible. For me, so something really serious happened, and you have Part F, part F, plan F. Yeah. Uh, they would have picked up the tab, but Medicare will not pay a penny for onboard doctors. The doctors we've dealt with, mostly me, uh, are very good. And we kind of think, what third world country did they get the degree from? Some of them just like cruising. And they're maybe older and maybe early retired. Uh, I feel we feel safe anyway, but we also feel safe for Nancy in the wheelchair. Of getting good care if we needed it while we're on the cruise ship. No issue with the wheel, being a wheelchair user on cruise. Uh, the, the hallways down to where the cabins are can be pretty narrow, and if they got a cleaning car around or something, it's a little bit inconvenient. But the accessible cabins are plenty big. Yeah. Some of them are gigantic. So uh, don't let being in a wheelchair dissuade you from going uh, on cruise if you want to. For my money, there's no place, there's nothing like it. Uh, the water's calmer. And especially if you want to stay on the boat, it's just beautiful to look at, even if you aren't getting out. And Alaska, I don't think any of the ports are sensible. I think they're all docked. So you can get off, and it's you know, last I checked, Alaska is part of the United States, so they are under ADA law, and they do have. Uh, Accommodating onshore for uh, wheelchair movement onshore. So that worked out pretty good. Okay, uh, I just made some little notes here about some other things that we found. Uh, Disneyland and California Adventure, I know it's changing gears pretty quick. A lot of their rides are being adapted to where the wheelchair users can stay in the wheelchair and roll right onto the ride. Not all of them, not all the rides, some of them you're just out of luck, you're not going to be able to do. Or if there's some you have to transfer to a. Yeah, some chair. of them you'd have to be able to transfer to a manual chair. A manual chair. Yeah. Um, your favorite? Well, you have to go to a manual chair because it won't have the weight. Yeah, some of them. It, that it, small it, world won't hold the weight. Yeah, can't, yeah, small world can't take. Small, small world has one where a manual wheelchair can just roll right on. Because it's a boat, it can't take the weight of the power chairs. Yeah. Uh, is everyone familiar with the national park uh, passes? You can get uh, with a letter from your doctor you know, confirming your diagnosis. You can get a free pass that will get you into the national parks and federal uh, recreational lands. BLM lands. Yeah, BLM lands. We went the first time we went to use it was at the Quinn Ahead Lighthouse here in Newport. And I pulled up and I had my free pass. It was going to my free pass. Her free pass. It was saving me eight bucks or whatever it is. I handed it to them and they looked at it and said, Well, thank you very much, uh, sir. But it's free for everybody. Here I thought I was getting away with something, but not getting away with something. Uh, for those of you who like to camp, Oregon State Parks have an awesome system of yurts. They, uh, they have a lot of them that are accessible, no bathroom. But they do have an accessible bathroom and accessible shower if you get people who don't need it out of it. Uh, it's a nice way to still get involved with camping. The yurts themselves, the big tents, is kind of what they are. They sleep five, there's a heater, there's lights, no cooking, uh, no, no stove or anything inside. But it's uh, better than sleeping on the ground. And we, we are read for a lot of years until Nancy wasn't physically able to climb into the uh, RVs. So it's a way to get out in nature and camp a little bit. I think any park that has camping probably has at least a few years. They book up State parks. Early. State parks, what is it? I don't know. I don't know. State parks. Uh, they book up early. I think it's, I think right now it's running about 50 bucks a night, 60 bucks a night. Cheaper hotel, if you like that 
lifestyle we live in. So that is something that uh, is uh, available. How are we doing on time? Almost good, Joe. Okay. Uh, I'm going to blitz through something that we have uh, gotten into. When I first did this presentation in 2017, we hadn't done it yet. And now we've done it a lot of times. And that is traveling by train. We have gotten, we've taken probably a dozen long distance trips on Amtrak. Across the nation six, seven times? Six or seven times we've gone coast to coast, one direction or the other. Uh, the accessible sleeper car, uh, sleeper cabin on train, and they're usually only two or three per train, is the whole back side to side of a train car. You have a seat for two that face each other, which turns into a bed. Another bed falls down in the ceiling. And then beyond, next to that is room to park a wheelchair. And beyond that is the toilet, it's got grab bars, and you've got a sink. No shower in there, but you have big picture windows down both sides of the train. My wife travels with a camera on her lap taking pictures. And we've got you have various scenes on those pictures. 80 miles an hour, the train's going down the track, and she's snapping pictures of waterfalls and animals. It's relaxing. Uh, with the uh, sleeper cars on Amtrak, meals are included in the price. But the dining room is upstairs. So what they do, they bring us menus, and we order from our attendant, and he brings us the food. And the food isn't half bad. It's, uh, the first time we went long distance, we just got off a 12-night cruise. The first night, I ordered a steak because I could, and it cost me more than ordered a hot dog. That steak was almost as good as any steak I had on the cruise. It was really tasty. Now, they went to a COVID prefab microwave meals for a couple of years. That was, I got old, but their regular menu uh, is bad. It's rather diverse, and it's uh, actually pretty good food. It's a great way to see the country. They're very, very helpful. They have ramps to get on. There'd be no stepping on the train or stepping off the train. They have lifts, but they have ramps. Uh, this accommodation I told you about has a door. So you close the door, and you're in your own little uh, cubby there. I wouldn't suggest coach or business class where you're in a chair like you'd be on a bus or on that on the airplane. And so you really wouldn't want a small sleeper because there's no place to put anything. But plenty of room. And Steve, could you talk about the cost for the caregiver? Yeah. Okay. Well when you book an accessible rope, when you book as a disabled person, you book what you're disabled, your companion you book with you are both 15% off. So you book as a disabled and you book as a, for a second person as a companion. And then it, the website's terrible right now. It'll, when you go to look at the, at the rooms, it says you want the accessible room and a room at for your companion to sleep in. And you have to get rid of the second room to bring the price down. But their website's glitchy. They won't adjust the price right now. So you have to call in to do it because they're assuming that the companion is going to be in a second room. But it's 15% off of what a regular price is for both the disabled and the companion. The charges run about 400 bucks a night for the two, for the two of you. And, and a little bit, you know, you said, well, I'm going, it takes only three nights to go coast to coast, three or four nights to go around. <laughs> You say, well, four nights, that's 1600 bucks. We go first class for that. But you can't see what you can see from the track. And it includes all your meals, which the surf and turf on the rail menu is like 35 or 40 bucks. But it's zero for a sleeper car. Yeah. Uh, we found it, yeah, it's maybe a little spending in it compared to other forms of transportation. But it's so relaxing. And we crossed the Mississippi three or four times when it was frozen over. One, one time we went last March, there was probably 20 eagles on the snow huddled together or close enough on the Mississippi River. We've seen deer standing out on the frozen river. Yeah. We've seen all sorts of animals. Amtrak, we, we absolutely love it. We're going to Niagara Falls in September of this year. Thanks for taking me to Niagara Falls. Uh, three nights to get there. We're going to be there three nights, three or four nights coming back. 
same routes we came. We came in almost all the major routes. And then in uh, next year, uh, okay, next year we're actually going to go from Tampa, Florida, to Seattle, Washington. So and corner to corner on Amtrak. You know, it'll be one, two, three, four sites. And then we'll drop back down into St. Louis for our home base. So uh, I'm a big Amtrak fan. It's relaxing and you watch the world go by. Two downsides to Amtrak. Not the cleanest. The, the, the bedding is fine. It's, it's washed, it's, it's packaged every month. But the carpets sometimes look really grimy. They're, some of the cars are getting older. Some of them are getting older. And another issue, which uh, I told you the two seats that you sit in have the table to fold out from the, from the wall and you, you can play cards or eat. Uh, those two seats make into a bed. The other bed folds out of the seat. Well, Nancy obviously can't climb the stairs. And her crazy husband is claustrophobic. It took me a little while. It took me a little while, but I can sleep up there on the shelf, as I call it, and uh, I'm doing better. And she has a little fan. She has that rolling on me. I got soft music playing. I hammer the Benadryl. Uh, and the train car goes all night. The train never stops. Well, it stops, but it doesn't stop for hours. And uh, But I, I got used to it. And... Uh, so your caregiver is going to have to be able to climb the steps, three or four steps. You're strapped in. The bedding is the bed itself is pretty comfortable. That is the Mississippi with the eagles on it. On ice, uh, yeah, ice over. That is amazing. So we decided at Linda's funeral, and then when Nancy diagnosed, no bucket. We are not going to get to the end of Nancy's ability to travel and say, we really wish we would have. Well, and that's why now we are life. we are building in more down days where I'll just sit on the deck and look and not go do anything because I have to catch, get my energy back again. Yeah. We, we've, uh, Nancy's favorite cruise was the Panama Canal cruise. Uh, I was done after a while. It was fine. We've now done three. We have two more next year. Amazing. Okay, let's do a little, uh, going to go over some questions in the chat, but I want to back up just a little bit. You talked about Disneyland. Disneyland has a whole accessible site. And also when you check into Disneyland, you can go and um, they have ambassadors specifically for people with disabilities. So make sure that um, you look at that site. It takes a little bit to find it. But it is there both for Disneyland, California Adventure, and Disney World. They actually have a pamphlet, brochure, whatever, that has all the rights listed and what's required to get on that. And how to access it. Sometimes you go in through the exit. Uh, when you talk about Disneyland and how they've changed their rules for uh, well, what for, for better. Now, if you, instead of just going in the back ex entrance and bucket the whole line, you have your card scan and they tell you to come back in 20 minutes, two hours, whatever the length of time would be if you were in the line of moving with the everybody else. Because they, they actually have a lady in Los Angeles who rented herself out for birthday parties. She's a wheelchair user. She's getting $80 an hour to go to Disneyland with birthday parties because your whole party goes with you. No. And then we cut out two hours yeah. worth of wedding in Los that was before they changed it. Now, now, so now they changed back. it that if the wait line is two hours, your wait is two hours. And that now is out of work. Or out of that job anyway. So anyway. Okay. Nancy, you got a nice photo for showing your eagles on the on the Mississippi River. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> and also one of the things that came up earlier is if you need to use a Hoyer lift in your hotel room, make sure the bed has room underneath it, meaning it can't be a platform bed. And lots of hotels have platform beds. Um, so you've got to make sure you can call. Uh, I have done this with the Graduate Hotel, which is the old Hilton down in Eugene, where we had to make sure that a Hoyer could be used there before somebody uh, was going there utilizing one. So definitely great tip. Um, one of the questions that came up, does anyone have any 
tips for car travel. This has become incredibly uncomfortable for me and I have to sit in the front seat in getting into and out of the car to and from my wheelchair is challenging and difficult. There are some modification things that you can get. A car assist, which is the handle that goes, it shapes a U, kind of like a U handle and it can stick in your, the latch of yeah, your I door have, handle. I so, have that. Okay. Or yeah. slider cord. A slider board. Where are you hearing us? Yes. Uh, no, Nancy, Nancy so there's a, a slider boards. It's a it's a board board that you would that you put under your hip and then slide into uh, into the car. As far as fatigue after a while of being in the car, man, that was tough. I guess partly don't plan long. They, and back in the old days, we'd say, we're going to drive 12 hours today. If we were going to do a car trip now, it'd probably be six hours. So we're stopping in the middle for an hour. Mm -hmm. I can barely do two. We live in Seaside, and we have to go to Portland for my health care. And that's about, I mean, by the time we get to Portland, that's just, and we usually have to stop because it's just too much. It's too much yeah. to sit in that mm -hmm. position. My feet go numb and my legs, you know, and yeah. then if my legs and my feet are numb or from sitting in that position too long, then I can't get out of the car to get into my wheelchair. We've got a helpful hint that was placed in the chat and that says we used a satin pillowcase on the seat to make it easier to swivel in and out on the seat, especially helpful when the seats are made of fabric. So being able to pull on that satin pillowcase to, to move a person. There's something called a Beasley sliding board. And basically it's, it's curved a little bit and there's a round disc and then there's a slot. So a person gets from, the, they put their wheelchair higher than the seat they're going into the driving, into the passenger side. They get onto that little uh, disc and it kind of slides them into the seat. And um, Christina, I'll, I'll sh send an email with a picture of that. Depends on your car, right? Everybody's car is different. I just looked at someone's truck. I'm like, there's no way. Can't do it with a pickup truck that's high up. But, you know, maybe you have a midsize car yeah work. my mom has a corolla okay i will send a, a link with that to you okay thank you thank you mm -hmm. well i'd like to thank everybody for listening to me ramble the last hour <laughs> uh, good questions good comments uh like i said we are going hard at it i retire five weeks from the day and we leave for a four-week vacation the next day <laughs> we're going to be cruise ship in Vancouver, and we're not getting off for four weeks. 28 days, same cruise ship, same route, up north and south, north and south, <laughs> north and south. Or whatever. I might have put a bunch of people north or south. We That's awesome. We're just going to go. So I want to make sure that everyone on the call knows we'll follow up with a handout from Steve and Nancy that will have helpful hints. Um, and they list some of the places that they have really enjoyed um, so that you can have that information. And that will go out in an email in the next few days. This has been recorded. So if you want to watch it, I don't know, eight months from now and think, oh, I remember Steve and Nancy shared something with me, you can come back to this and watch. There's a lot of thank yous coming up in the chat box for you, Steve and Nancy. Well, I appreciate both of you and the fact that you're living life with ALS, getting out, traveling, going everywhere, and that the, you're open to sharing all of this information with us, your adventures and some of your misadventures. We well, can all learn. Helpful. Hopefully it was helpful. And, and well, 
Maybe Stephen can go show him what give him what we see when we're not traveling. Okay. I unplugged the computer from the power. This is a little extra credit here and see if I can make it work. And it kind of goes along the lines of living our dream while we can. I don't know if this is gonna work. I gotta turn around. A year ago, January, we moved. I don't know if you see here. To the Oregon coast. We, are, we live in Depot Bay. We're right on the rocks. And uh, sitting here watching whales go by. We're whale people. That's a whole other meeting. Is that lined up okay? I can't see it. Yes, we can see the coast. Yes, we can see the ocean. We can't hear when we hear it all night long. Awesome. So anyway, it's all a part of, you know, live, was that uh, Tim McGraw song, Live Like You're Dying? Yes. We're, we're living like... You know, we're not promised tomorrow, let alone five years, 10 years, whatever. We are just, right now, we still enjoy each other's company. As long as that's going on, we're going to travel. We're going to stay. This is a great place to live, but living where I vacationed before. There's a lot to see and do. It might be curtailed a little bit because of the wheelchair use. There's still a lot of stuff out there we can do, and we're doing it. So I encourage you to do the same. No regrets. That's that's kind of no regrets. So thank you all for uh, tuning in and letting us ramble. Um, hope it was good. Hope I didn't waste your time. We did waste your time. And uh, you. if you if you had any questions come up, you can run them through Mary. Uh, she'll send them to us. But we're really just people. We're not experts. We're not book writers. We're not professional travelers. We just done some, and we've experienced a lot of them. Mostly great. And so I'm not so great. So hopefully you learn from my mistakes, our mistakes. Yes. Well, I'd like to thank both of you, Nancy, for sharing your 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 long journey to diagnosis. I think that's also helpful for the we definitely have some folks with PLS on the call. That was lovely that you shared that. Um, also appreciate uh Steve and Nancy for sharing today and being willing to jump on and do this. We will follow up with an email in the next two days, and we will also be uploading this to our website in the future. Again, thank you, Nancy and Steve, and I wish everyone an enjoyable evening. Thank you. Take care, all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.